Welcome everyone to the Fall Loveland Library Gardening Series. My name is Allison O'Connor and I'm the horticulture agent for CSU Extension in Larimer County. We are thrilled that you're here to join us. Our speaker today is Susan Bonsell and I will introduce her in just one second after we do a couple of housekeeping things. So the first is that this session is being recorded. So if you need to leave at any time, that is absolutely okay. We understand that you have other obligations and it will be recorded. Everybody who has registered for this class will get an email with the recorded link when it is available, along with any sort of pertinent handouts and other information from the class. So just know that. We have set the chat feature to only get questions to Susan and I, so you won't see your fellow participant questions. But if there is something that you need clarification on, please use the chat feature. Please note that we will only be sticking to the questions at topic. So please don't ask why your beagle is snoring or other things that might be considered irrelevant. Uh, we want to keep the, the questions to the subject at hand. And Susan will take several question breaks so we can address those. Uh, should the security of the meeting be breached or we have any concerns, we will immediately end the meeting. We will restart using the same link a few minutes later, so just know that that could happen at any time. Uh, we ask, we thank you for your patience on that. We don't anticipate any of that happening, but just in case it does. So without further ado, I am very pleased to introduce you to Miss Susan Bonsell. Susan has been a longtime master gardener with CSU Extension in Larimer County. She is a very good vegetable gardener and has been in the program for almost a couple decades. You'll have to tell us, Susan. She's going to be talking about end of season gardening. We are thrilled that she's here and our thanks to our host, Loveland Library, for making this series happen. Susan, take it away. Thank you, Allison. Thank you for the introduction. I think everybody, I go away now as far as a visual, um, <clears throat> but you'll be able to hear my voice. Allison has told me that possibly my voice is not coming through as clearly as it could, so I will try to speak very distinctly and very loudly. Um, and I have to comment on our beginning picture. I discovered, we discovered this this morning setting, it's a little fuzzy. So I'm thinking, yeah, that's how we feel after a long and full hot summer season of gardening here in Colorado. Uh, but then we had this little bit of sleet and snow. I don't know if you all did, but I certainly did, but it didn't take down very much. It, there was not very much damage. So fall, while it pretends it's summer, actually is here because the days are shorter, the nights are longer, and both are getting cooler. So <clears throat> now is the time to turn into our non-heat of the summer activities. For example, oh, okay, Allison, it did not move. <laughs> I'm trying to move the... Uh, I, can, I can hear you trying to move it. You might need to use the buttons. Um, I or am. just click on the slide itself. Okay, clicking on slide, everybody. Here, oh, look. Let's They're done at the bottom. bottom. Perfect, <laughs> there you go. Allison is always my backup when I have technological problems because she is so good and I am not so good. But anyhow, these are things that we could do in the fall, fall garden activities. We could certainly extend the season. Uh, <clears throat> nature has provided us the opportunity to keep some of our vegetables growing, to keep our annuals growing as long as we cover them up. So I'll be talking about extending the season. I will also be talking about harvesting. I mean, good grief, this is time to harvest as well. Fall harvest uh, and maybe some of end of summer crops harvesting. Definitely talking about garden cleanup. That's a, a quintessential fall activity that we must take uh, care of in order to promote a good garden for next year. And I will be talking about planting perennials and bulbs. That's something that we do every fall. So <clears throat> today's agenda, talking about those garden enders, that frost and freeze. Otherwise, we, live, we don't live in the South. So we, have a, we do have a distinct end to our season. And sometimes we can outwit it for a while with our season extenders. Talk, I'll talk about fall harvest, some of the vegetables that we're harvesting, fall cleanup, for vegetables, annual flowers, perennials, and bulbs. You say bulbs at that point. Hmm. Fall planting for vegetables, perennials, a different kind of bulb, cover crops, pruning, 
tool care and miscellaneous tasks. So, <clears throat> well, what, what does happen? Why, why do our gardens come to an end? Well, it's because freeze and frost do come. And what is it? Well, we know it's about 30, 32 degrees for a, a light frost, we'd call it. Uh, freezing from 28 degrees Fahrenheit below. What happens is inside of a plant, frost is ice crystals, and they could be needles, fans, feathers, and it's actually very pretty. Look at the pictures, very pretty. But when that happens, when these ice crystals form inside of plant cells, the cellular liquid freezes and it forms these crystals, and these sharp objects actually puncture the cell wall. And then when the air and plant temperature warms up the next year, excuse me, the next day, <clears throat> these ice crystals liquefy. It leaks out of the cells and it dehydrates the plant. And that's what actually kills the plant. Voila, dead, blackened, wilted looking plants. However, there are plants that grow close to the ground and they may survive our freezing a little bit longer due to the warmth generated by the soil. And this heat gets conducted up maybe a few inches uh, to the plant and keeps them a little bit longer that they, that they don't have frost damage and they don't freeze. When soil is moist, it holds four times as much heat as a dry soil and it conducts it faster. So this soil warming is what we're taking advantage of when we cover, when we extend our season, when we cover our tender plants. So for warm season crops such as basil, tomatoes, squash, peppers, cucumbers, you need to, you know, you listen to the weather, you know a frost is coming, they tell you on the TV or wherever, you check your um, computer, you know when it's coming, you can cover things, you can cover with buckets, floating row covers, old sheets, tarps, burlap, bank blankets, this floating row cover, you can see it on the left hand side of your screen, it's a light spun polyester or propylene, polypropylene fabric, um, which can float above a crop. It's nice to put them up on hoops or stakes. Um, and then when you do that, you need to remove them in the morning because you don't want things to heat up, especially under those buckets. And here we are doing the same thing, tarps, blanket sheets, floating row covers. The key here is actually to let them drape to the ground. They have to drape to the ground to capture that warmth of the soil. Now on the left, you'll see some blue, and I suspect those are plastic tarps. And I just want to say with plastic, it's not the greatest thing to cover your plant with, because when the plastic touches your flowers or your vegetables, it really does conduct the cold and you'll get uh, frost problems right there. If you can use stakes or hoop, that's okay to lift them away from the, <clears throat> excuse me, from the foliage, that would be good. Now here's a trick, and Allison said she tried it this past time. We thought we were gonna have that freeze and had some snow. If you have the hoops, you can cover them and run some holiday lights um, to warm up inside. It's like a little greenhouse. You can warm up an extra six degrees if you do uh, put in your lights. So those are your vegetables. Cover them up, take, them, take the covers off, drape them to the ground, maybe put lights in, maybe not but you're really going to extend the season for a number, at least a number of weeks, especially with our warm weather now. It's, we're, going, we're, we're doing well right now. Now your annuals, same thing. There's nothing different here. You wanna use buckets, uh, blankets, floating row cover. Here's someone covering up some snaps. Um, and then take it off the following day when the temperatures are about 60 degrees or so. You don't want your plants to get too warm. And again, not using that plastic. The other thing you can do is you can bring some annuals indoors. I do that every year. I bring my basil in, I bring my geraniums in, I have brought some uh, snapdragons in, just in pots. And then you have to be careful not to have any hitchhikers like fungus gnats or other creepies. I tend to get these worms that come out of, uh, caterpillars, excuse me, that come out of the uh, geranium pots. And you wanna monitor for water. They're not outdoors in the sun. They're not outdoors in the wind. So they may not need, they may not require as much moisture. And hey, make cuttings. I've been cutting my zinnias and my uh, marigolds and bringing them in as bouquets, which is really nice. And then there's some point where we call it quits for all extension of our vegetables or our annuals, et cetera. So no more extending. It really is time to harvest. If frost does touch your tomato, I'm gonna to talk about a number of 
vegetables right now. If frost touches your tomatoes, it's, it's really the end. You can eat them if you're willing. Don't preserve them because their acidity level is different from a fresh tomato. Clearly they don't even look that good. Um, no more extending tomatoes. Before frost, if you get out there ahead of time and you're not extending, you can pick all the mature green fruit or fruit that's blush. You can see it kind of a blush orange, mature green fruit from the vines. You want to save only blemish free, uh, nothing with soft spots, sun scald, holes, or any problems with the tomatoes. And then take them, remove the stems, wash them, allow them to dry. And you can store them in a well ventilated area that's open cardboard box, for an example. They will ripen inside. It takes about uh, two weeks at 65 to 70 degrees. Uh, 55 degrees, it'll be three to four weeks. Now, since we live in a, a dry climate, our dry climate can make these tomatoes shrivel a little bit. So that's why some people wrap each one in newspaper to keep the, the feeling more moist, keep more humidity around the tomato. One way you can hasten ripening is to add a ripe tomato in the middle or in a couple of places in that box of your tomatoes because ripe tomatoes give off ethylene gas, which is a natural ripening hormone that will um, have things ripen more quickly. Now turning to peppers, it's kind of a lost cause. You've got to bring your peppers in before the frost. Otherwise, if they're out on the, on the plant, they will turn very mushy and, and rot. So if you can't cover them, pick them ahead of time. Um, pretty straightforward there. Winter squash and pumpkins. Winter squash are great. They're best when fully mature. So to check it, you can push against the rind, push against the skin to see if it resists penetration by your thumbnail. If so, they're pretty darn ready to come in. They're fully mature. And when they are mature, they become drier and the, uh, the actual flesh develop sugars so they're better tasting if you can bring them in. They can take a little frost but certainly not a hard freeze and they can be stored in a cool situation. It says 32 to 65 degrees. I say go for your 50 to 55 at most um, and then when you cut them leave a stem of about an inch and they'll, st they'll stay there for about three to four months if you've not brought in anything that's damaged or has a problem in terms of, you know, just checking out in general in terms of uh, if it has been frost damaged, you wouldn't want to try to keep that. Well, here's potatoes. Who grows potatoes anymore? Well, I do. <laughs> and they're great, they're fun, they're fun to grow. But when the frost hits, the, the vines will die. The vines will go down, but the tubers, the potatoes are fine, but you want to harvest them as soon as possible. And between harvest and storing in a cool, dark place, you want to let them cure, I'll call it, or dry out a little bit on the soil in the garden for about a week or two weeks. Now, if for some reason we're getting rain or snow, cover them up with a tarp because you don't want them to get wet. You're trying to get them to cure. And once they're cured, you can store them um, for quite a period of time. 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit is good. Onions, lots of us grow onions. Those tops have started to lay over in late August through September. They, you want to stop your watering at that point and then lift the onions to break the bulb away from the ground, away from the roots, and then leave them on the ground for one to two weeks to cure because you want that stem, you want that neck to dry out. You don't want that to be still moist when you try to store your onions. So when they are dried out, cut the top off, leaving a little, a little uh, neck right there, and make sure they're thoroughly dry. And you can store them in burlap, uh, the, bag, the netting bags that you get out of a supermarket where you know, you've seen onions in them. Or I have a wire basket I store mine in. And they really do like cold. You can store them almost down to freezing and they will be fine. So I'm going to do a little pivot here. We've extended the season uh, as best we can. We've started to harvest things, but let's go into the fall cleanup. Fall cleanup is so essential. Um, I don't even know how to emphasize this enough. Good sanitation is the key to a healthy, healthy garden. 
And we do that because we're trying to prevent any diseases or any overwintering insects that are in the garden now from staying in the garden all winter and then showing up next year and giving you problems again next year. So as you're cleaning up, you want to make sure that you take out anything that has had any kind of problems, whether it's an insect problem or a disease problem, and take that plant material and throw it in the trash. Never put that into the compost pile because insect eggs, fungal spores, other organisms will stay on the plants. So healthy plants, on the other hand, you know, it sounds like I'm talking about all our, <laughs> that all of our gardens are diseased and terrible. They're not, but a few plants may have some problems and they're the ones you want to get into the trash. But healthy plants you can compost for sure. You want to remove those summer crops? Well, we talked about harvesting, but if for some reason you didn't get out there and things have been frosted, oh my goodness, it's time to pull all of them out. Your tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, everything, summer squash, um, all your melons, and you've harvested your onions and tomatoes by now. So all of that goes, and all of the, the healthy plants can go into compost. There are cool season crops that have been grown in the summer, or maybe planted in the middle of the summer to get a fall crop. And these guys are great. Broccoli, kale, spinach, cabbage, Brussels sprouts. I have a picture of cauliflower that it is not as um, hardy as these other, and spinach isn't quite as hardy. I let them stay in the garden, frankly, to get several frosts. The low temperatures turn the starches into sugars. They taste a lot better and they can even make it. I, I've had my broccoli go through several hard freezes. Now I have to say at some point in December, <laughs> it's time to remove them from the garden as well. But this is some, these are crops you don't have to bring in right away. And there's some, crops that you might want to leave in the garden. Some of your vegetables, I call them crops because I'm used to doing it, uh, vegetable gardening in kind of a large manner or, or farming with um, a big vegetable truck farm. But your carrots, your parsnips, your rutabaga, turnips, you can actually leave them in the ground. And what you do is pile a deep layer, layer of straw, leaves, or other, other material. And when I say deep, I mean a foot to a foot and a half high over that row cover those, that material with a tarp and, and weigh the tarp down with some bricks or something. I live in a very windy area, so I'm always talking about wind and holding things down. <laughs> and then what happens is you can actually dig these out all winter. I've been known to go out in January, get the tarp off, get the mulch off, and go down and dig some perfectly good carrots. So if you're interested in having fresh vegetables that you've grown uh, through through the summer and then into the winter, there, there you have it. So fall, however, is more than just harvesting your vegetables. It's for what I call the search and destroy mission, making sure you remove problems from the garden. And by this list, you can see there's a lot of insects that will uh, stay on garden debris, whether it's on the plant, on weeds, they will stay all winter and reinvigorate in the spring, essentially. Earwigs, flea beetles, leaf miners, potato beetle, squash bugs, cucumber beetle, they also will be in the soil. Hornworms pupate in the soil, thrips pupate in the soil. So they're in the soil over winter. And the interesting thing about um, hornworms, hornworms like our tomatoes. If you've ever grown a tomato plant and you've gotten one of these long, four inch long, hornworms on it, you know they, they destroy our tomato plants. So that's, this is the reason that you want to move your tomato plant and or plants into different parts of your garden next year, the following year, etc. You want to rotate that crop because the hornworm is in the soil and will come back and destroy your tomato again. I'm going to do this very quickly. There's lots of pathogens. There's lots of fungus. One we all know very well is powdery mildew. It's on our peonies. It's on our uh, cucumber leaves, our squash leaves. It's a fungus. And so when you see it on anything, those are the plants you want to put into the trash and not into the compost. Uh, late tomato blight, same thing. A problem, there's bacteria. If you see any of this stuff, 
get it all out of the garden. There's good reasons for all of this. So in terms of sanitation, you also have to dig up and remove decomposing roots of vegetables and annual flowers. And the reason is the roots, the decomposing roots, um, release disease-causing microbes into the soil. And so you don't want those in the soil, you wanna get them out. So it isn't just like snapping things off at the top. If you have fruit in your garden, and I do, I have my apple trees in the garden, I have plums and cherries, etc. Pick up all that fruit and any fruit that's still on the branch, we call it mummified fruit, it never really uh, got to uh, fruition because those fruits will provide an excellent reservoir for pathogens returning next year. And all of this is pay it forward. Pay it forward to have a good garden next year. Fall weeding is a must. Well, this is your time to pull out perennial weeds, bindweed, Canada thistle. What they're doing is moving carbohydrates and nutrients into their overwintering root systems. They're perennial, so they're gonna come back next year. We don't feed the root systems. You wanna get them out. If you're spraying, chemicals will go into the roots now, so you can do that. If you're just pulling them or taking them from the top, at least you're depriving them of photosynthesis. Annual weeds, same thing. Pull up to control uh, the development of weed seeds that'll be in your garden for next year. You wanna rake that soil, take out any remaining uh, debris, et cetera. This is the time to do uh, search, and search and destroy, is what I call it. So Allison, this might be a time before I pivot on to perennials, how we deal with our perennials. Are there any questions that uh, have come up? Just a couple that I've been able to answer. The only thing, Susan, is I hear a little bit of shuffling of papers. <laughs> And I think you have some notes for your presentation, so just know that we can hear that too. Oh, okay. Hey, Thank so you. But the audio is good. I, I feel that your your voice is coming through nice and clear. Oh, that's good. Um, and, and clearly, folks, I do use notes because, oh, well, the memory, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, no so one can remember all this. Who can remember all this anyhow? Well, a lot of it is from experience, I have to say. And a lot of it is from truly our Colorado State University Extension material which I will talk about at the end, uh, some of our resource material, so that you too can have all of this in your hand or on your laptop or on your computer. But I'd like to pivot now to perennials. Susan, uh, can, we, can we do one more? One, one question did come in. This oh. is from Becky, and she said she's heard about no-till and leaving roots in the ground, but it sounds like leaving the roots of annuals and veggies is not good. So do you have any comments on that? It's a great question. Thank you, Becky. I appreciate it. Um, I have done no-till farming, uh, so I actually do favor it. Uh, tilling in your garden does raise up weed seeds. Uh, I don't know how to answer. I'll be honest. I don't know how to answer it because I think what I'm talking about is if you've had something that's um, diseased or problems, that's where you're digging out all the roots. If you do no-till for the rest of your healthy garden, I think that's fine too, because apparently you haven't had a problem. Does that answer your question? I, oh, I can't talk to you, so I guess we're talking to Allison. It does answer it, thank you. And two others came in too. Uh, so Lori would like to know about powdery mildew. If they spray, should they also cut and remove the damaged leaves or will the spray help remove it? Cut and, cut and remove. Definitely. Yeah, so with powdery mildew, if you don't mind me jumping in here, Susan, with powdery mildew, it's really something the spray would prevent it from happening. But right. if you're seeing it on your plants, yes, like, like Susan said, cut and remove. Yeah. Um, Tiju wants to know about caterpillars on kale. Are they still good to keep growing and then compost later whatever's used? So it sounds like if they had caterpillars on their kale, could they still compost those tissues? Yes, you know, I have kale that have holes in them, so the caterpillars have been on them, but the, if the caterpillar's gone, it, it's still an okay plant. You know, I'm, frankly, between all of us, I'm still harvesting that kale because I don't have a problem with that. So I don't have a problem with composting it if that insect, if the caterpillar is gone and not being put into your compost. 
Allison? You can you can go ahead. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure if you were pausing for me. So I am going to pivot. I'm going to pivot to perennials because perennials clearly are plants that span more than a year. They're perennial. They don't get taken out of the garden at the end of the year. And there's always a back and forth conversation about whether to leave perennials untouched for uh, winter garden structure and beauty or food for wildlife versus the neater appearance and less work in the spring. So my suggestion or the way I see it is to compromise and, and I think we can do both actually. There are perennials that you do want to cut back and of course it's going to be the ones I talked about that have any kinds of disease or insect problems. Cut them back, put them in the garbage. Blackened foliage doesn't add any visual appeal whatsoever. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, that might be your peonies. Of course, they probably have powdery mildew. You want to get rid of those. Daylilies, Veronica, <clears throat> the irises, some lilies, they can all be cut back. If they're not adding any visual appeal, I'd say go ahead and, and cut them back. Now, Shasta daisy, globe thistle, salvia, these are uh, ones that grow their new basil leaves now. Mine have started to come up. So when you do cut back, you just have to be careful not to get into the new growth that has already started uh, for the following year. And in terms of cutting, I always suggest using a bypass pruner. That means the two, I don't know if you can see in the pictures, but the two edges are the sharp edges. An anvil pruner has a flat surface and a sharp edge. With the bypass, you get, <clears throat> excuse me, just get a, a more clean cut through the, through the plant if you're cutting back. I will say this, you want your perennials to go through several hard frosts until cold has killed back the tops. We're looking for that because this allows roots time to reclaim the energy from the dying plant to keep it strong for reemergence in the spring. So there are perennials we'd want to leave uncut. Clearly our, our beautiful grasses, I mean, uh, wow. Indian grass, switchgrass, blue grama, feather grass, fountain grass, maybe I already said that. They provide beauty in, uh, I'm gonna preface this, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So if you don't think they look beautiful, maybe not, but I do. And I think it, they do add winter beauty to a garden and they might capture, some, if we do have any snow or any moisture, they'll capture some of that snow, will help insulate around the plant as well. Now here's beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Interesting, you wanna leave uncut things that are attractive. I have Autumn Joy Sedum, I happen to adore it. Maybe your holly is gorgeous, you wanna leave that for the winter or your red twig dogwood. Um, again, it's up to you, but I, you could leave those uncut if they provide you something that you like in your garden over the winter season. Perennials to leave uncut, again here, food for birds. Purple cone flower, your perennial sunflowers, all seeds, the gold yarrow is great for finches, they love that. The um, uh, black-eyed Susan is good. And I'm, I always have this thing, if you're encouraging birds to stay around in your garden now, they might stay around for the next season in spring when you want to, them to be eating some of your aphids or bugs. So uh, I'd say leave some for the birds, but that's my thing. Some people may want to cut everything down. Oh yes, those that are marginally hardy. You might want to leave them uncut in that possibly, um, and it's Anis hyssop, chrysanthemum, red hot poker. If they're allowed to collect leaves or snow for insulation around them, because they're marginally hardy. Now, the thing is you could cut them and maybe just put compost, or not compost, but mulch over them. That's another way to do it. So either way. Another fall task is dividing. Now, it turns out we don't divide everything in the fall. Peonies and, popsy, peonies and poppies, when the foliage dies, yeah, because they've already bloomed in the spring and early summer. Now's the time to divide them. You can also divide your iris and daylilies, even though the flowers have come and gone, you can divide that this time of the year. The ones that you don't want to divide are your mid to late summer blooming perennials, your chrysanthemums, which are blooming now, your asters, which are blooming now, and those plants you don't divide, but next spring before they start growth is the time to divide them then 
and put out other uh, put out your new plant. So let's look how to do that. Obviously, you lift the parent plant using a spade or fork, being careful not to destroy roots in that process. Remove it from the ground. I don't know if you can see it all, but some folks like to squirt their uh, uh, roots to get any loose dirt away. You can knock it away, but separate your plant into smaller divisions. You can tease the roots apart with your hands, cut them with a sharp knife or a spade, uh, put two forks in the center and go pulling back and forth. And I'm thinking, they don't mean dinner forks, they actually mean <laughs> forks for your garden. Um, but however you do it, make sure that the division has vigorous shoots on top and healthy roots below. And that before you plant them, you wanna keep them shaded and moist until they're replanted. But I'm assuming, I'm making a big assumption here, that wherever you're gonna put your divisions, your new plants that you've taken apart and uh, want to replant, that you've already amended the soil, you've made it rich, you've made it good. So then you could put things in right away, right after you make a division. Here's the iris, even though uh, they're not, uh, they have rhizomes instead of roots. You dig up the whole clump, divide with a sharp shovel, or a knife by hand, you can pull them apart. But you wanna select the newest rhizomes. You'll notice that some, excuse me, are kind of old, rotted, withered on the edges. Take those and destroy them, but then select the newest rhizomes with visible buds. This is where you're gonna get your new plant. Plant the smaller units and water. And I say water is key. I'll, you're gonna hear me say water mulch, water mulch, water mulch, because we're gonna go through a bunch of plants. But water is key because our winters um, are often very dry, low soil moisture, dry air, no snow between October and February. Again, we're in Colorado. This can, <laughs> things can change very quickly, but in general, we can have very dry winters. So you do need to water and you wanna water early in the day at 40 degrees or above. Uh, if you have a small garden, clearly handheld uh, wand can work. I have a large garden, so I use soaker hoses everywhere or um, drip lines. That's very good. Just make sure you do it above freezing temperatures because the waters will, the plants will need that water if our conditions are so, so dry. And we don't know, we can't predict that. We live in Colorado. And then after watering, of course, we, we're mulching. We're mulching to protect our plants from uh, wind, it stabilizes soil moisture during freezing thaw. When you think about Colorado, it's like freeze thaw, freeze thaw, freeze thaw. And what happens is plants can actually get heaved out of the ground or bulbs can get heaved out of the ground with that freeze and thaw cycle. So to prevent that, we want to uh, make sure the roots don't get exposed. So we want to mulch them, but mulch them with um, material that's coarse and loose to permit air movement to the roots. Root tissues actually continue to metabolize in the winter and they require oxygen to do this. Otherwise, if you reduce the oxygen, soil pathogens get a little aggressive. So we wanna make sure that that oxygen can get through the mulch that you do use, uh, whether it's shredded leaves from uh, deciduous trees, uh, some straw, it, it depends what you like to mulch with. I happen to like to mulch with straw, but it's gonna stop that cycle. So we're still removing things from the garden. We only planted our divisions so far. So before we get to planting perennials and bulbs, we have things to take out of the garden. And some folks like to have their spring planted summer flowering bulbs in, the gladiolas, the canas, the dahlias, the tuberous begonias, um, they get planted in the spring, they bloom all summer, but they're not winter hardy. They've got to come back out of the ground. So we take them out of the ground in the fall and store them. So when I say bulbs, I'm just going to say uh, they actually come from corms, tubers, tuberous roots, rhizomes, but um, the general term is they're all bulbs. So in general, we wait until everything has been blackened and then lift the various tubers, bulbs, etc., corms, out of the ground and put them in a airy sheltered spot to dry for 
maybe two weeks, three weeks at most, because you really don't want to put anything that's wet into storage. Uh, bulbs can have rot on them. They'll decay if they're damaged, especially when you dig them out. It's easy. Oh, it's so easy to put your fork right into a um, one of the bulbs. So you don't want to store any of those, but shelter them for a couple of weeks and then store them into vermiculite, peat moss, sawdust, in a place where, haha, -ha, our friends, the mice and other rodents, if you have them, I don't know who doesn't have them, but anyhow, assume you do have them, <laughs> all of those bulbs are premium food. So you have to store everything securely. So let me run quickly through some of these gladiolas when the tops die. Obviously, you cut back at the, uh, uh, the juncture with a knife, you can cut off uh, from the bulb, cut it off, and then allow the uh, bulb to dry. It's actually a corm. I, I'll just tell you this time, it is a corm. And what happens with corms, a new corm throughout the season has formed on top of the original corm you put in. So you want to get rid or remove the withered corm, you can throw it away and then store these new corms after their drying out period in this frost-free cool place. Dahlias are a little bit different. When the vegetation is killed by frost, you wanna prune back the stalks about to six inches. And then you leave the tuberous roots, and there's a picture on the right-hand side there. You wanna leave those tuberous roots in the ground for about two weeks, because they need to be hardened before you dig them up. And then when you dig them, do it carefully. You can see they're splayed out a little bit. So you want to go several inches away from where you think they are in, in lifting them up. And then again, the same thing, getting rid of the soil, uh, letting them dry so you're not storing anything uh, wet going into your storage system of sawdust, vermiculite, whatever it is you're going to be using. Canas, same thing, very straightforward. After the frost kills the foliage, you want to dig, dry, and store and tuberous begonias. Uh, the one thing about tuberous begonias, that one you don't cut off the foliage with a knife. You wait until everything's dried out and it will, um, the stem will snap off at the, at the bulb down below. So they're a little bit different. So before I pivot to fall planting, because we're going to be planting now, how about another round of questions, Allison? If you have any questions on this section, please type them in. One question came in from Maureen, and I did answer her, but she just had the question of where do you buy straw for mulching? Oh, oh, um, oh, I don't want to name uh, companies, do I? Uh, certain garden centers will sell straw. Certain feed uh, companies, uh, how do I say, put it from? Farm supply stores. Farm supplies, yeah, thank you, <laughs> that's generic enough. Uh, sell straw, because people need straw all year long for bedding their animals. So yeah, they're sold, it's sold all the time. Um, Lori has a question that she's never divided plants because she's afraid that she'll kill the cherished parent plant. Um, she realizes it might be slightly irrational, but any advice to get the, over this? And I think that's a common thing. <laughs> I love the question. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you're taking this living thing out of the ground. Is it going to survive if I pull it apart and, and put it back in the ground? Uh, the answer is yes. I, I mean, I don't know psychologically how to help you get over that, except to try it with something, uh, a plant that, that you're willing to, if you think it's going to not go well, <laughs> but you're willing to sacrifice, which it will go well. That's just it. Pull it out exactly as I said. And um, if, if you've taken it apart and you have those good shoots and you have the roots and you have your soil amended and everything's moist and wonderful and you put them back in, uh, chances are, and I won't give you a percentage, but I'm just going to say chances are everything will thrive. I, I, I'll be your cheerleader and I, I suspect uh, if you try it with something once and find out it's okay, that you'll, you'll do it again. Lori, thanks you for the reassurance. Um, there was a request if you could go back to the previous slide, Susan, and then there's two more questions that came in. One was from Linda of how to make cuttings from geraniums. How to make cuttings from geraniums. 
And if you're not quite sure, there is a good publication from Iowa State that I can send out. I just referenced it this morning actually for another customer, um, but I'd be happy to send that out. Essentially, you take cuttings from the parent plant, you usually dip them in some sort of rooting hormone and then plant them into a, a media of sorts. But Susan, if you have any other advice on geraniums, no, well, that's exactly what some people do. And that, that's what I was going to say. Take the cutting, put it in a rooting medium, and then plant them and keep them. Um, I will just admit to uh, all of you, I don't do that. <clears throat> I bring all my geraniums in and I cut them back. I have a three-tiered light system. So they actually live indoors in the pots all winter long. And then when it's time, they go back outside. And they've actually grown over the winter. I have to cut them back. So I don't do the cuttings but the, and the rooting medium, but I do have friends that do that. So thank you, Allison, for saying that. Yep, and I will send out that link um, in just one second. And then Becky just wanted to know is after you mulch with straw, do you then pick up the mulch, the straw mulch in the spring for regrowth? Uh, the, the mulch that I've put around my perennials? Yes. Yes. Yes, because I'm, of course, again, I'm making assumptions about your garden. Often perennials are in a very nice situation. They're very lovely. You probably don't want straw all over the place, but you may be mulching with uh, some mulching material like wood chips or something like that to be making it more attractive. So yes, yeah, straw is not particularly attractive. I'm talking like an old farmer. I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's why I use straw everywhere. But in my, in my gardens where I do have all the perennials, I just have regular mulch that I buy in bags. Perfect. You can go ahead. Yeah, I, I went backwards for somebody. So I'm going to go forward to fall planting of vegetables, if that works for everybody. Uh, <clears throat> garlic is the quintessential fall planted vegetable crop. Uh, this is when, this is the time you should be buying seed garlic from your garden center or farmer's markets, from catalogs. I do mine via a catalog. Um, there's actually a garlic store in Fort Collins. I have never been there. If anybody out there knows about it, you can type it into the chat box and tell Allison and she'll tell you. But the, the um, issue is that you don't necessarily want to plant the garlic you see, the garlic bulbs that you see in the grocery store, because they may not survive our winter here. They may not be from this area. Uh, and they may be a hybrid of something that's not going to do well here. So I really suggest getting seed garlic if you're going to do garlic. Yes, and now, now, now is the time to plant it. Six weeks before, you know, fall frost, hard freeze. Make sure the bulb is plump, firm, clean, good sized. And then you separate it into the cloves, as you can see. Oh, and here's somebody holding one up. And you want to plant them. Uh, three times the size of that bulb down and about three inches apart and then water in and mulch. And then I'll tell you next July, you're gonna have a great crop of garlic. It really is the best time to plant garlic. And because I'm kind of a garlic fiend, um, when in the catalog, if you get to catalogs, if you do it that way digitally or on paper, there's many kinds of garlic. There's hard neck, soft neck, ones that you braid, ones that you hang, um, and, and many different kinds of Russian red, German, German extra hardy. Garlic is, is really a great crop, a great fall crop as far as vegetables. Other vegetables, you think, what the heck is she planting? Well, carrots, parsnips, kale can all be planted in the fall. You've cleaned out your garden. There's probably a row there where, you've, um, where you can amend the soil again and you could plant carrot seeds parsnip seeds kale seeds and if you plant them now and mulch them heavily water mulch them heavily there's that big fat mulching i'm talking about that foot high these guys will be the first ones to come out in the spring and you'll be uh, rewarded for your effort this fall so those are vegetables and planting how about annual flowers. Well, we want some color now. We still do. The ones that you can grow are violas. They're actually a kind of a small short-lived perennial, but let's call it an annual for now. Flowering cabbage, kale, snaps could be put in, snapdragons. They can all 
take a frost or even a freeze, especially if you extend the season. Uh, they'll last and be a spot of color. And our other spots of color, boy, everything's on the market now. The fall perennials are pansies, asters, rebecca, chrysanthemum, sedum. They're all out there. And this is the time of year that you want to plant them. Uh, often sold in one or two gallon containers. That sounds a little big. Some are in smaller containers. <clears throat> But what you want to do is work your soil. Obviously, I always say that. Amend your soil, but then plant the uh, whichever one you've chosen or many at the same depth as they are in the pot. Water in, obviously. Keep moist until a hard freeze, and you want to mulch them with that light, airy material. Nothing that'll pack down around them. So now's the time to plant perennials. It's, it's just great. I'm sure you've been out and seen some of the garden centers or even box, well, box stores, supermarkets. They're all selling these fall perennials now. Okay, we have another kind of planting going on called bulbs. These are our fall bulbs. These are spring blooming bulbs. They're the ones we know so well that brighten our end of spring, early summer. Um, daffodils, tulips, hyacinth, crocus, snowdrop, squill, Allium, this is the best time for planting them. Uh, they're on the market. There's a direct correlation, by the way, between bulb size and size of the flower. The bigger the bulb, the more likely to produce a robust flower. Bulbs are stored food reserves. They're like little refrigerators in the ground. They're the food reserves for next year. And these food reserves, these bulbs, have to go through a chill cycle. That's why they get planted in the fall and then uh, chilled throughout the entire winter. I think it's 16 weeks. And then come start growing in the spring. Again, the same thing. Each bulb that you look at should be plump, clean, firm. If you're choosing them from bins, you can pick them up and actually squeeze them and feel that get a sense of heft with them, that they're not uh, dehydrated in any way or desiccated. And if you're going to a catalog, you can look for top size bulbs. That means the biggest, uh, they're best bulbs, basically. Now is the time to grow them. If you plant after October, flowering can be irregular, but some folks say it's better to go ahead and plant even if you have to plant a little later rather than keep them all winter. So plant your bulbs now, go out and get them now. Uh, the flowers do last la longer if you don't choose a spot that's a ton of midday sun. So some of our smaller bulbs, and I'm gonna be talking about each one, you could plant under deciduous trees because in the spring, those trees aren't leafed out yet. And they'll get like a uh, very sunny partial shade on them, which is good. Not a surprise, I'm gonna say this, well-drained soil, rich in organic uh, matter. Now the question of fertilization comes up a bit. Some uh, people say you gotta fertilize at the bottom of the hole. Yes, yes, yes. The thing is the bulb booster fertilization, that's a lot of phosphorus to give us our beautiful flowers in the spring. Chances are your soil has enough phosphorus in it. Uh, we don't lack phosphorus in our soils here. However, this will be my plug for getting your soil tested. Uh, and I usually plug that every time I give a talk because if you don't know what's in your soil, you don't know what you can grow or what it needs to grow things. See, uh, Colorado State University does have a soils testing lab. I'm not saying that's the only lab around, it's just one I'm familiar with. Um, and there are kits that you can get at garden centers anywhere and test your soil, send it in, and they'll tell you exactly, and tell them that you're growing bulbs. They'll tell you exactly what your soil needs to grow the best. Uh, spring blooming bulbs ever, ever in life. So um, I think I'm going to give you a chart here. I don't know how well it's going to show. It's I have a little laptop that I'm working from, but hopefully you can see that the bigger the bulb, it's actually the deeper it goes. It's four times the height of the bulb, three to four times the height of the bulb, tip side up, that you're measuring from the bottom where you put it and the top of the soil. So big bulbs like daffodils, you can see are down at the eight inch range, sometimes it's 10. Some of the bigger tulips, six to eight, early tulips just at six, or hyacinth six, maybe eight depending. 
we get some of those smaller uh, bulbs, the crocus at four, the squill at four, um, grape hyacinth at three to four. So it depends on the size of the bulb. You just measure the size of the bulb and multiply that by three to four. And that's how deep your hole is going to be. Now, in terms of design, it's they're best in groups or clusters. I think it's fine to have an individual uh, tulip here, an individual uh, narcissus or daffodil somewhere. But in terms of design, when you cluster them, they m make a much more striking uh, statement in your garden. So I always say do plant in clusters or groups, especially the small bulbs. I'll be saying plant, plant them in masses or drifts. And you space them according to size. The large ones, you space them out six, three to six inches. The small ones, one to two inches apart. And I will say with the growing tip up, just be sure you, you do that. That's kind of important. And <laughs> once you plant them, remember those rodents I was talking about? Now you may not have any mice or voles or squirrels, but if you do, those bulbs are like uh, candy. They're down there and they will dig them up. So one suggestion is to cover where you're, let's say you put in a, a, a section of uh, tulips right there. Cover it with chicken wire. Once you've covered it all back up, obviously, they're down below. Cover that with chicken wire and put garden staples around the chicken wire. You can do that. They will grow up just fine in those one inch uh, openings of chicken wire. Other people put down crushed shells which are sharp or crushed rock, which is sharp to deter the rodent from uh, digging, digging them up. So let's go on to some, I don't know whether I, I feel, uh, should I stop here? I'm just gonna go through some individual bulbs for now. I think that'll, that'll work and then I'll stop again. Does that work for everybody? <laughs> Actually, Allison, you're the only one I can hear, so I don't know. <laughs> go ahead. Okay, thank you. <laughs> So let's talk about the fav well, one of the favorites, I should say. There's actually 13, what do I want to call them? Classifications of daffodils. There's hundreds and hundreds of different kinds, and they're classified by the size of the trumpet, the size and shape of the petals, whether they're short, whether they're long, what colors they come in. There's so many to choose from. That's why I say, go to your catalog and start drooling. <laughs> and decide which ones work well for you. Now's the time to plant, obviously, late September, early October, well-drained soil, six hours of sun. We kind of talked about that. Uh, if they're in the midday sun, maybe they fade a little quick, more quickly. I, mine are all in the midday sun, seems to be fine. It's eight inches deep, three to six inches apart, water mulch when freezes. What I like about daffodils, besides their bright sunny faces in the spring, which I actually had a neighbor uh, walk over to my house without me knowing it and cut down my daffodils in the front of my house and took them home. She later confessed and said, I needed, I needed those. They were a bright sunshine <laughs> for me. And I said, fine by me. What's nice about daffodils is there's really not a lot of pest pressure. The deer won't eat them, the antelope, the all of those guys, the elk won't eat them, not the antelope, the elk, the rabbits won't eat them. So you can put them out away from being hidden behind a fence or some um, other barrier to keep these guys, keep animal pests out. Tulips, everybody loves tulips. Tulips are beautiful. Uh, so many different colors, so many different sizes, so many different configurations of coloring. Uh, again, there's about 12, classifications of tulips. And one way to think about your garden is to plant early blooming, mid blooming, and late blooming season tulips in all your different colors. So you stretch the season out for a number of months actually. So it's not just one burst of color at one time, you get it over a period of time. As I said before, Larger bulbs will yield larger flowers. We're back into well-drained fertile soil, amended as needed. Depth, it depends what bulbs you get. Some of the bigger bulbs down eight inches, some of the smaller or mid-sized down six inches. After soil temps drop to 55 degrees, uh, three inches to six inches apart. 
and water well after planting and mulch after the garden uh, ground freezes. Tulips are adored by rabbits. They are adored by deer. So all of my tulips are in a protected garden area. I have, fen I have fencing around my, inten uh, my entire garden. So they're not bothered by them. So I don't know where you live or what pests you have, but certainly deer uh, will, uh, they get them right away. So protect them, put some kind of barrier between that hungry animal and your tulips and then you'll have them. Hyacinth. Now poets have written about hyacinths for centuries. The exotic aroma, the, the odor is gorgeous. If you like it, it's one of those personal things. I happen to like it quite a bit. Hyacinths are beautiful, planting six inches deep, three to six inches apart, well-drained soil. The thing about all of these bulbs, and I'm bringing it up here, uh, if you have heavy clay soil, those bulbs may frankly not do well. The heavy soils constrict proper growth. And remember, these are storage, food storage organisms. And if they're constricted, your flowering will go down over the years and they'll, your, your plant will deteriorate and you won't get very much. The other thing is, if it's not a well-drained soil, the bulbs can actually develop some sort of rot, and you don't want that. So well-drained, once again. Um, I have this on here about wearing gloves when planting to prevent hyacinth itch. Hyacinth bulbs can uh, make your hands itch. That's all I can say. So if you want to wear gloves, great. If you don't, just wash your hands afterwards. I don't wear gloves. I just wash my hands afterwards. I will say, and I forgot to say this earlier, the outer skin, we'll call it, on bulbs, the tunic. Sometimes it's easy to leave some of that on the ground where you've planted. It kind of fell off right when you were planting. Be sure to pick that up because that smell is very attractive to our rodent friends or population, we'll call it. Grape hyacinth, uh, much smaller. They're much smaller bulbs, three to four inches deep, two inches apart. Grapes. Great hyacinth, excuse me, well-drained soil. Because they're small, um, about six inches high, you can plant them in drifts, um, in great masses. The ones that you put in full sun will have more vigor. The ones in partial shade will just last somewhat longer. Um, well-watered, they will naturalize in the sense they do tend to move, get, move around a little bit, not jump around. I'll give you some ones that jump around. These guys don't really jump around, but they'll naturalize and they'll relief. My grape hyacinth are up in the garden looking much better than they did all summer because once they bloom, they kind of go uh, down. And then in the fall, they come back and, and give you relief. Now this is, what, <laughs> this is a picture I particularly adore. It is the Kuchenhof Garden in the Netherlands. It's a river of grape hyacinth. I mean, it's, it's, do you realize how many bulbs that is? Um, if you ever wanted to recreate something like this, how many bulbs you'd have to, uh, to buy and plant, but it's absolutely gorgeous. So there's, there's grape hyacinth for you. So let's move on to some of the still smaller bulbs, the crocus, snowdrop, I'll say snowflake and squill. Uh, crocus are technically members of the iris family. There's more than a dozen species. Uh, the blues, they come in actually pink and white and yellow. Uh, they're actually corms. They're, when I've been using the word bulb, they're actually corms. And corms, uh, remember you've, re how do I want to say this? Corms, you want to plant flattest side down in the soil at a depth of three and a half to four inches. They are small, so the most effective, they're planted in drifts. Um, you can see in that lower left-hand corner, actually a lawn under a tree just filled with crocus plants. And remember the tree, because they're such a spring flower, they're not really being shaded by the deciduous leaves yet. And so it's a good place to plant them in drifts or tuck them in your, tuck them in your garden anywhere. Um, anywhere that's full sun, well-drained soil. So let's move on to snowdrop and snowflake. They're actually different plants. They're not the same, although they sound the same and they kind of look the same. Um, I'm not sure I could pronounce the Latin, <laughs> but snowdrop is galanthus, 
novillus or something, and snowflake is liquorium astivitum. But they look the same, except snowflake, there's something called a summer snowflake, which gets 20 inches tall, versus these very diminutive plants that come out very early. You know, they're three, four, at most five inches tall. You do want your, of course, uh, well-drained soil, full to partial sun. They could be tucked in anywhere, woodland edges, meaning um, kind of like borders. They tolerate our high pH, which is nice because we have alkaline soils here, planted in masses, absolutely, absolutely. And they bloom very early. Snowflakes can come up through the snow. So um, they're very early. And then they go down and they're dormant for the winter. So if you've planted them in a lawn area, you can actually mow right over them, not a problem. They've gone dormant for the, for the summer. I didn't mean to say winter, for the summer. The clumps can be divided and they're not particularly bothered by pests like deer, rabbits, voles, etc. So it's a good thing to be out on your lawn where these animals may be roving. I just want to point out, I'm hoping you can see this, uh, the snowflake, while it looks like a snowdrop, has little green tips on the edges of its petal. I just think that's the most precious thing uh, to see. So the last of our small bulbs, well, yeah, well, small plants coming from small bulbs is squill. Now, Allison, you should know about squill, Siberian squill, because it's big in Minnesota. Uh, Well-drained soil, good organic matter. Some people say, well, plant, two to three inches deep, spacing apart two inches. Good for planting in turf, again, on your lawns, in masses or drifts. Some experts say never plant less than a hundred bulbs at a time. <laughs> That's one heck of a lot, but they're tiny. So, and they do spread, which you may or may not want to have happen. They are hardy and cold tolerant and very attractive, very, very sweet looking. This is the last of our bulbs that I'm going to talk about. And then we can take a little break. Allium is in the onion family, very ornamental and showy. It can grow from six inches, some of the varieties, to three feet. I think it's called Allium giganteum. And very attractive, very a bold statement in your garden. You can plant the, uh, the bulb two to four inches deep, well-drained soil, not a surprise. They will proliferate. They will jump around the garden. Um, those seeds will fly everywhere. And if you like that, great. If you don't, pull them out. They do attract bees and butterflies. Uh, this is the time to plant them. And I'm showing you some of the purpley ones, blue, but they can be yellow, red, or white as well. And I, I say, uh, it, for me, it's a great addition to the garden. I like it. They've actually jumped out onto the lawn and uh, apparently nobody wants to eat them because they come up every year on the lawn as well. Allison, is this a good time to take a break? I only have a little bit more to go, but happy to take questions. You know, there weren't too many. Um, the, there was one comment that maybe space garlic bulbs out more four to six inches so that they get a little bit larger. So you have seed garlic for next year. That was a recommendation. Okay. And I, I think you can continue on. Go ahead. Okay. So we're down the home stretch, folks. Um, I do want to talk about cover cropping because I, <laughs> here I am, old farmer, but it does make a difference. People plant a cover crop for a couple of reasons. One, to uh, prevent soil loss due to wind and water erosion. That's not so much here, possibly, but it certainly improves soil structure. You increase the organic matter. So when you put in some uh, ryegrass and some vetch, and it grows up a little bit and you turn it under, it's called green manuring. It speeds up the natural soil building process. It reduces weeds. Uh, it's beneficial for soil microorganisms, earthworms. And importantly, in our dry climate, cover crops increase the soil's ability to hold water. And you could see here the grasses, rye, sudan, oats, buckwheat, legumes, peas, beans, alfalfa, et cetera. Most people plant two of them combined and then let them come up and turn it under. You plant it in the fall, although you can do spring cover cropping as well. Um, legumes, I think you probably know about legumes, like peas and beans. 
what they do is host bacteria that take nitrogen from the air and fix it on nodules on root hairs. Nitrogen, NPK, that's what we want in our soil. So it's very, very good for the soil to do a little bit of cover cropping in amongst your garden. Uh, maybe do some rotation around some cover crops. Uh, pruning, very quick, don't do it. Don't prune now. Notice the X over all those tools. You want to wait until spring, actually, because when you remove tissue now and you open a wound in a plant, uh, in your shrub, for example, uh, it still has the winter to contend with and the pruning injuries may not heal. Uh, there may be dieback at that site. So actually our shrubs are spring flowering shrubs, lilac, forsythia, uh, Nakin cherry, quince, spirea, viburnum, honeysuckle. Let them go through the winter and then once they flower in the spring, that's the time you can thin them or uh, cut them back or do whatever you need to do. Because right now, if you were to cut back, you'd be cutting away, frankly, the flowers that are going to grow next spring. So don't cut any of them now. And what you do want to cut, however, if you have raspberries, this is the time to cut them back. If you have the kind of raspberries that's floricane, primocane, which means floricane had the berries on them this year, cut all those back. Primocane means those are going to come next year and have raspberries, keep them. Now, some uh, raspberries are all primocane, depends what varieties you buy. If it's all primocane, you can cut the whole row back. But even in cutting back, you want to thin because you only want six raspberry plants per foot, per row foot. So you can be thinning and cutting at the same time. Grapes, they grow on new wood. So you cut it this year so that the new wood uh, will be growing your grapes for next year. Okay, tool care, we're in the home stretch. Pretty obvious what you want to do. You want to clean your tools. You know, clean with water, take a steel brush if they're stubborn soil. Uh, make sure they dry even if you towel dry them, however you want to dry them, to prevent rust. You want to take those pruners or shears, put a little oil on them with an oily rag or the WD-40 there to make sure they don't stiffen up on you. Uh, wooden handles, put the oil on it, prevent cracking. I have some good old shovels that are way cracked because they never got the attention they needed. If you need to sharpen things, sharpen your, sharpen your shovel. You're going to be using it next spring and next summer and sharpen your pruners or loppers and put everything in a protected area. Miscellaneous tasks, pretty obvious. Uh, taking out the stakes, the cages, the markers, man-made objects. A black plastic, for sure, if you've used that as a uh, mulch throughout the summer for whatever reasons, take that out because chances are they will harbor some of the insects or diseases that I've been talking about. You want to shut down your watering system. If you have a small engine, I have a little tiller. Uh, not everybody gardens that way, but if you do, you want to drain the engine or use a fuel stabilizer. That's what I do. I kind of like that. If you've had plants in pots and they're dead, obviously you're going to remove them. Uh, you want to wash and store those containers. You can wash the uh, containers in a 10% bleach solution, like 10% bleach in a gallon of of, um, of water and dry them before you store them. If you're doing crops, remember where those tomatoes were and where you're not going to put them next year or whatever it is you need to rotate, go ahead and rotate. And this is the fun part you get on mailing lists, uh, either digitally or in terms of sitting with a catalog by the fire, going over what you're going to plant next year because um, the garden goes on, at least we hope it goes on. So here's our resources. I think maybe Allison referred to some of this, but we do have a website, uh, extension.colostate.edu slash garden. And in there, you're gonna find fact sheets, garden notes, and plant talk. <clears throat> fact sheets and garden notes are longer articles on a plethora of topics. I've pulled one out, I've cited one here because it's germane to this topic, fact sheet number 7.410. It's on fall planted bulbs and corms. In the garden notes, I, uh, I'm citing frost protection extending the growing season, number 722, and then one on climate, uh, 746. But each of these have many, many, many other topics if you were to peruse the whole 
uh, garden note section or the whole fact sheet section. Plant talk is another way to get quick information. Generally speaking, the articles aren't as long. They could be as long as one page, sometimes as short as a couple paragraphs, but they're on every, every topic you can think of with regard to horticulture, and you can listen to plant talk as well. NoCo Bloom is one of the publications. Um, Allison is one of the uh, <clears throat> strong supporters, um, inventors. What's the word I want to say? You started this thing. Um, and you hear from the horticultural agents, master gardeners, people in the green industry about all things uh, in horticulture. I think the last issue has come out. It'll start up again next year. It comes quarterly. The C uh, Colorado Horts blog, this is where we get to read what our horticultural agents throughout the state are talking about. What's current, what's current for them, what they're working with. Um, and they're totally fun because you get to get to know our agents a little bit better. Call us, and by us, I mean you can call the Master Gardener hotline at any time. Somebody will get back to you, or you can email us, and somebody will get back to you. So thank you so much for coming and listening. I'm sorry I can't see all of you and talk to you in person, but Allison, thank you for setting this up and letting it happen. I, I'm so appreciative. So I'm finished. Super. There were a couple of questions. I'm going to bring you back on camera because um, oh. people want to see you. So there was a question about fall seeding of perennials. So do you have any favorites or tips and tricks on how to let it? In my garden, it just happens. So like coneflowers and columbine, it they just do their thing. But I didn't know if you had any other resources for those, the stratification. Um, hang on, Allison. You wanted me to start my video, and I pushed it, but nothing happened. I can see you, so you are present. Oh, but I can't see me. No. <laughs> should I stop screen sharing? No, I should leave that up. Okay. You can leave that up. I think the resources are great to see. Okay. So we're assuming that people can see me, even though for some reason it's not not working for me. And the answer, the question was uh, reseeding of different perennials that they just scatter themselves. That's absolutely true. Yes, and just any any tips you have or recommendations of plants that do best when seeded in the fall. I pulled up a list, but I was just looking to your expertise too. No, I don't I don't have a list. Because you're talking about seeding a perennial versus dividing a perennial. Right. Yep. So like coneflowers will self-seed, as will columbines. Um, sunflowers, a lot of the perennial and annual sunflowers will set seed for next year. So then you have. Yeah. And yarrow will. That's another one that seems to jump around and reseed itself. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, then there was a question from Tiju about when you empty your containers, what do you do with the soil? Do you throw it away or do you throw it in the compost? What's the best recommendation? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. I, I actually do get rid of it uh, because I don't know what's been harbored with that plant for one thing. And you can't really reuse it. You want fresh soil every, uh, every year. I'm assuming for a container, you're buying potting or planting soil and then uh, using it for that year and then discarding it for the following year. So no, I don't put it in the compost, I actually do discard it. But I, I'll have to, I will admit something to you, I actually live on a big property. So it, when I say discard, it's not going in my trash, it's gonna going out with the, um, how do I call it, the, the back 40. <laughs> I think that's fair and that's what I do too. I actually put my container soil into my vegetable garden where there's good microbial action going on and I've never had any transfer of insects or disease because mm. It, it seems to work well. So um, if you keep your container soil, we do recommend that you replace it by half to a third each year um, with full replacement probably every three years. It's an expensive investment, but you can reuse as long as you replace it a little. Right. Um, there was... Oh, I was gonna say thank you, Allison, for saying that because in my really, really large containers, I only take up the top half and I keep the bottom half for a number of years. Because I have, I have huge, huge containers out on the patio. Yeah, it's too much to replace. Mm -hmm. So those are all the questions. Tons of thank yous and really, really, really excellent information. 
For those of you still on, as a reminder, we will send out this recorded link to everybody along with resources that not only Susan has mentioned, but a couple others that I wrote down. And we wish you all the best. And for those of you who are still on, I'll answer your last few questions, but this is the end of the recording. So enjoy your afternoon. Thank you, Susan.